Well, it's a real pleasure for me to welcome you to the ULAR Congress 2020. For the first time ever, we're bringing you a virtual e-Congress. Of course, we would far rather have met together in person in Frankfurt, but the coronavirus pandemic has really changed the world in which we live and has forced us to move into the virtual universe. I am, however, really confident that you're going to find the e-Congress is a real celebration of scientific and educational excellence. We're going to offer you an update uh, at the very cutting edge of the rheumatology field, and we're going to tell you about some of the finest science in our discipline. A lot of this, of course, is down to our Congress Scientific Committee, brilliantly led by John Isaacs and Loretta Carmona, whom you're going to uh, meet later on in this opening ceremony. We have brought our original face-to-face -face Congress down into the virtual world, but I don't think we have brought the quality down. On the contrary, I think you'll find that the content is really superb and absolutely informative. Now, the COVID pandemic has changed our lives in almost every way imaginable. And to those of you who have suffered personal or familial loss, I extend my sympathy and empathy. I think all of us as professionals have been affected. We're doing things that we didn't used to do. And especially for our patients, people with the rheumatic and musculoskeletal diseases, it's been a time of inordinate anxiety and stress. And I think it's therefore especially wonderful for us to come together and celebrate rheumatology and all of the achievements in our discipline, perhaps casting aside some of the other darker thoughts that the pandemic has brought us. Now, bringing a virtual Congress into reality is no mean feat. And to the Secretariat in the ULR office, I can offer only my most sincere thanks. What they've done for me is a technological miracle. And I'm sure all of you by the end of this Congress will agree that we've really moved uh, mountains to bring content into the electronic universe. A few final remarks around the, the ULAR community. We are three pillars. We are the professional societies, health professionals, and most importantly, all focused around patients, PARI. We're a community of people who are utterly committed to making a difference for people with rheumatic and musculoskeletal diseases. We're also a partnership, and it's a real pleasure to welcome not only our European delegates, but also our friends from around the world. We work in very close collaboration and harmony with ACR, APLAR, AFLAR, ILAR and PANLAR, and to all of you, we extend a very special welcome in these challenging times. So I thank you for your understanding. Thank you for joining us. I'm really looking forward to this Congress in the next few days. I hope you will enjoy it as much as we have enjoyed putting it together. And of course, best wishes and every good health. Let's get on with the Congress. So innovation is at the centre of everything we're trying to do in ULAR, whether it be in education, advocacy, increasingly in research, or in every respect trying to represent the best wishes of people with rheumatic and musculoskeletal diseases. And it's therefore entirely appropriate that we look to a leader, a global leader in the area of innovation. And it's a special pleasure, therefore, for me to welcome Claudia Leverens to the welcome ceremony here. Claudia is a remarkable man who has, through formation of enterprise, empowered people with all manner of disabilities. He has a remarkable story to tell, and I commend it to you. Claudia, over to you. Hello, Ian. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here, and I'm very happy to be able to share my story, but to also direct your attention to one of the stories that has been like most predominantly with me throughout my whole journey. I want to start with um, a number and the number is 1.3 billion people. That's the number of people that live with one form of disability. It can be visual or non-visual, but most of all, all of their lives who have a disability have been impacted by that. Now, I want to start with a short story. During our clinical trial, where we developed a solution for people with disabilities, I met Andrea. Andrea has a muscular disease, it is multiple sclerosis, and she has been depending most of her life on the help of her family, her husband, to be able to be mobile. And that's actually a topic right now that is concerning lots of us. We have been impacted by the current situation and our mobility has been really decreased and that's what happened also with people that have to um, be diag diagnosed with uh, multiple sclerosis. Um, and actually, Andrea has been in this situation forever. 
Now, the current solutions that are there for, for Andrea and other people with these kind of diseases are very mechanical. Most of them have to be put upon a wheelchair or they have to be installed with screws and everything. So you spend a lot of time and most of the time it's adapting to it. Now, in this current times where technology is everywhere, what is the future? What is the future holding for people like Andrea or people like us? We already got used to using mobile phones, worldwide connection. We're connected through everyone around us. So most of the solutions right now, as you can see here, are solutions that have to build around the person. And here, Andrea has to use different devices in order to be able to control different things. But it's always have to be around her on top of the wheelchair, for example, and it's all mechanical. So there are a lot of screws, there are a lot of like devices around you. What would the future look like? And part of that is already happening. So I'm very excited. As you can see, there are already devices that enable people to walk freely like an exoskeleton. There are already other robotic control systems that help you drink or eat by yourself without having to use your hands anymore because it's rather impacted through your disease. And what's most importantly, devices like Smart Glass connect all of those into a platform together. Into that platform, you would be then able to control many things around you. It can be, con you can control your home environment, turning on the lights, turning on the TV and zapping to your favorite TV channels. You can also interact with robotic persons right now that enable you to just create that connection that enables you to become more independent in the end. And in the end, the vision is here that like through these devices that have shown extensional, ex exponential potential in the end to connect to all of your environment, people like Andrea would be then able to have a whole platform and ranges of possibilities to be independent again to not have to depend on her husband or her family, but to really engage with the technology, with her environment. Imagine being able to just control your TV by, by voice. Many of you probably already have that in your home and you, you're very happy to use it. For Andrea, who cannot even control the wheelchair herself, this is an amazing opportunity already there. But also imagine getting the access to messaging functions, to be able to send messages to your loved ones through a way that hasn't been able to um, exist before. Most of the time we all use our phones in a very easy manner, but since these diseases also impact your mobility in your arms, people are left alone with the devices that you saw before that usually don't have that functionality to connect to a phone and send a message or make a phone call. All of the wearable devices, just like smart glasses, come together that bring all these features already integrated in one. So by enabling this technology and creating a more accessible design, Andrea could also be able to now make phone calls through smart glasses and get in touch with the family that she so much um, wants to get in touch with. What I want to tell and share with you is that like this wouldn't have been able without us engaging with the patient from the beginning. The patient has been since day one at the center of our vision because without the patient, we would be missing a very important piece of the puzzle. And that piece is the constant feedback that you receive from the patient and listening to his or her needs that we can then incorporate into the innovation. So I am I'm um, approaching you today to share the most important cornerstone of probably uh, everyone's attention. And that is to keep persons and patients at the center of innovation. Through that, we would be able to increase the impact that we can have right now with technology and even in these times right now, this is the best way to engage with technology and innovation by bringing in together all persons and having everyone sit at the table 
to engage with everyone and in the end develop a far superior impact than we are if we cannot um, listen to the needs of the patient. So on that term, I would like to thank you all for your attention. If you want to listen to more stories, please reach out to me. But once again, I'm very grateful to be able to share with you this short story about Andrea and to invite you to put the patient more at the center of your innovation and your further work. Thank you very much. Well, Claudia, thank you so much for what is such an appropriate message. Uh, I have to say in rheumatology, we are, I think, at the very forefront of putting patient-centered care in the middle of all we do. And certainly in EULAR, as you recall from my introductory remarks, the pillars of EULAR are really focused around the well-being and the needs of people with rheumatic and musculoskeletal diseases. Uh, it's no surprise to me, Claudia, when I listen to you to be reminded that you are uh, nominated in the Forbes 30 under 30 in Europe in the category of science and healthcare uh, and are also a global shaper in the Munich Hub in the World Economic Forum initiatives. And I, uh, I, I think that fusion of enterprise, empathy and the critical understanding of what modern technology can bring to people with disability is just such a perfect fusion and a wonderful way for us to start our journey into this extraordinary program that is going to be the e-Congress 2020. So thank you so much for your remarks, which I found both inspiring and informative. Thank you very much, Ian. It was a pleasure to be here. Well, it's time now for me to introduce you to the chair of our uh, scientific committee, Professor John Isaacs. Uh, and he has been instrumental in creating what is really a terrific and rich program. John is the professor of rheumatology in Newcastle University. He is a luminary in European rheumatology and one of the finest translational immunologists and rheumatologists in the world. And he's also a personal friend. And for that reason, it's an absolute pleasure, John, to ask you to tell us a little bit about what you feel are the highlights of the program we're about to enjoy. Well, thank you very much, Ian, for that kind introduction. I mean, as you would expect, we've got a fantastically varied e-Congress program, which evolved from our original plans for a live Congress. And there's something here for everybody. I'm just going to mention a few highlights very briefly. So on Wednesday, I'm really looking forward to a session where we will compare the ULAR COVID-19 recommendations which are those, with those from the ACR. And we've got Robert Landaway from Amsterdam talking to Ted Michaels from Nebraska, who were instrumental in those two sets of recommendations. Thursday's a really busy day at the Congress, and, and my highlights there are a live session where John Stone from Massachusetts General will talk to us about what's new in IgG4 disease. For our paediatric colleagues, we've got a live session on treat to target in children and comparing the challenges with those in adults. For our healthcare professionals, we have a session implementing high intensity exercise for our patients, and another live session for our patients with arthritis in Europe, that's PARE, which is a COVID-19 session where they will receive an update, some information on the psychological impact of the disease and the risk factors. My highlights for Friday is our talks from Dan Klo, who's an anesthetist from Michigan in the United States. He's an expert in fibromyalgia, and he's going to talk to us about what's new in fibromyalgia management and treatment. And for our basic and translational scientists, we've got a session in partnership with the European Federation of Immunological Societies on the origin of autoantibodies. Finally, Saturday, a really important day always in our Congress, we've got the traditional ULAR recommendations when all of our study groups and task forces give us an update on, on what they've been up to during the year and the new recommendations that are coming out. And also, I just wanted to mention a really interesting clinical science session on artificial intelligence and OA. That's just the real highlight of the Congress for me. There's lots, lots more, as you would imagine. Well, thanks so much, John. It sounds fantastic. And of course, the great thing about a virtual Congress is that you don't need to miss a single session, which is, uh, gives you plenty of reading to do for the next several weeks, in fact. So, John, thanks for your guidance and advice. We're really looking forward to those sessions in particular. Well, of 
course, in addition to John leading the scientific committee, we've been really privileged to have Professor Loreto Carmona, who's one of the foremost epidemiologists in the world of rheumatology, who has had oversight of all of the selection of our abstracts. Loretta is going to tell us a bit about that and also the prizes that were awarded in response to the fantastic signs that we were sharing. Uh, Loretto. Thank you, Ian. Every year, scientists, rheumatologists, health professionals in rheumatology, and people with rheumatoid, uh, rheumatic and musculoskeletal diseases, uh, they submit their perfect adequate of research, that is the abstract, to the UDL Congress. These abstracts undergo a very tough peer review process, and some of them get the highest scores from all their peers. Eula wants to honor these abstracts who made it to the highest with uh, these awards. These awards entitled not only being present in the opening ceremony, but also a monetary award. And the list of awarded is the following. For the basic and translational research, we have Winnie Verstappen from the Netherlands on an abstract on the transcriptome of Sjögren syndrome. Christopher Lesser from United States on study on your study on Sjögren syndrome, where they found 10 new lossy. Simon Mastbergen from the Netherlands on a study on osteoarthritis pain under link to microphase. Yuvin Luo from China on an abstract on gut, microbiote, and rheumatoid arthritis development. And Shamuta Gur from Israel on an abstract on uh, scleroderma and immune uh, cells. In the clinical rounds, we also have abstracts, winners, who are, are the following. Martin Steffer from Germany, with a study on the risk of venous thrombolysis with DMARDS in rheumatoid arthritis. Anna Molto from France, with a study on a treat-to-target strategy in axial spondyl arthritis. Ulf Lindström from Sweden with a study on anterior uveitis and a comparison between different drugs. Andrea Lucchini from Canada with a program to reduce presentism and work cessation. Sebastian Unisoni from the United States with a study on biomarkers on giant cell arthritis. And Rona Smith from United Kingdom with a trial on rituximab in Anca vasculitis. Then we have the PARE Award that also goes for the best abstract. In this case, it goes to Brian Lynch from Ireland on a study on pregnancy and arthritis and a program, uh, education program in Ireland. The category of undergraduate is especially interesting because this is people who are yet not rheumatologists. And the winners are Xin Yen Liu from Canada with a study on anti-malaria uh, retinopathy in SLE and other autoimmune diseases. Arshed Alobairi from the United States with a study on the Bessel's disease and CD8 T-cell response. And Ana Pascual La Pena from the UK with a study on antibiotic use and ankylosing spondylitis. Finally, the category of the health professionals in rheumatology, the best abstracts and the awards go to Tin Pele from the Netherlands on a study on an application Dr. Bart for the use in people with osteoarthritis of the knee. Anthrist Vetter from Norway with a cost utility analysis of multimodal occupational therapy in patients with 
osteoarthritis. And Tuva Mosen, also from uh, Norway, on an astrat related to surgery of uh, osteoarthritis and guidelines. Finally, the Foreon Abstract Award. The winner is Martin Englund from Sweden with an abstract on the comorbidities following incident clinical diagnosis neo hip osteoarthritis. And these are all the winners of the awards this year. Well, thank you so much, Loretto, for sharing those with us. And my heartiest congratulations to all of the recipients of these awards. They're a reflection of an enormous amount of hard work. And we really do celebrate the quality of the work that you've given to ULAR in the Congress this year. Thank you so much. Well, now it's a real pleasure for me to introduce to you Professor Anna Maria Ignoco from the University of Torino. Uh, Anna Maria is my partner in running ULAR at the moment, along with other members of the steering group. Anna Maria is president elect of ULAR. It's a real pleasure to welcome you, Anna Maria, and I'm looking forward very much to listening to your remarks. Thank you so much, Ian. Ladies and gentlemen, we are people with uh, rheumatic and musculoskeletal diseases. They are health professionals in rheumatology, they are colleagues and rheumatology community. This is the first Euler e-Congress in 73 years of Euler history. And this e-Congress is held in a challenging and completely unexpected time when the pandemic has transformed our lives, our professions, our world. Particularly in this period, the future of rheumatology has a strategic relevance in the globe. The synergic actions and the work of different actors in favor of technological innovations and research developments are key for the future of rheumatology and will lead us to achieve extraordinary results. But what is the future of rheumatology? Well, the future is the discovery of new disease pathogenetic mechanisms, the development of new frontiers in rheumatic disease treatment, the invention of new diagnostic tools, the evolution of advanced educational strategy, and even much more. And all these elements in the future will lead to innovative approaches for the optimization of patients' care. The road to the future is difficult and complex, and the contribution of the world rheumatology community is fundamental. And in the last months, when the pandemic has changed our world, the importance of research and technology has demonstrated to be crucial for the future of the globe and for our lives. Euler has always invested many energies in strengthening and consolidating rheumatology. And in the future, it will go ahead supporting innovative horizons aimed at optimizing the care of patients with rheumatic and musculoskeletal diseases. But this e Congress is the demonstration that we are already in the future. Indeed, a few months ago, none of us would have ever imagined that a e Congress of such big dimensions and complexity would be held virtually. And this e Congress has collected the most eminent minds and the excellence in the field of rheumatology to report their experiences, their researchers toward the future. The participation of so many people from all over the world in this e-Congress will enhance collaborations and trigger new discoveries and horizons. So ladies and gentlemen, dear rheumatology community, enjoy this extraordinary experience, the EULAR e-Congress 2020, which will deliver the preeminent rheumatic disease Congress virtually, bringing together the most innovative minds to illustrate the future of rheumatology. Thank you. Well, thanks so much, Anna Maria. It's an inspiring vision for the future. And uh, as you point out, who would have imagined we would now be holding a virtual Congress of Rheumatology in June 2020? Uh, and whilst we would, of course, prefer to be together, it is remarkable that technology will support such a communication festival. But thank you so much for your remarks. So as we imagine this extraordinary future, 
it's even more important that the voice of people with rheumatic and musculoskeletal disease is heard. For some time, we've been shouting in an empty room. But over the last number of years, EULAR has moved to a really strong advocacy program, making our views clearly held in national and international fora. We'd like to tell you a little bit about what we're doing in EULAR now in the area of advocacy. It's a few years ago now when I began to notice that large lumps were occurring on my fingers and on my joints of my hand. I found it very difficult to work. I found it very embarrassing and I would be using a ruler or a pen to demonstrate something to the students because I just didn't want them to see my hands. I've got these hands, they're mine. I've got to carry on working. I have to carry on with my household tasks when I get home. But you just have to manage, and you can do. People simply don't know how dangerous RMDs are and how dramatically fast they can lead you to disability. Modern treatment strategies help us to control our diseases. They let us feel good, and look healthy and live almost a normal life. But almost is never enough. Just as we celebrate innovation and excellence in this Congress, it's also important to think back to those who brought innovation and excellence in times past. And since 2000, EULAR has awarded rheumatologists who have been judged by the EULAR Executive Committee to have served rheumatology in an outstanding way, either by scientific research, clinical science, or through their activities within EULAR national or international organizations. So it's a real pleasure for me to ask Anna Maria to announce the recipients of the 2020 awards. Thank you so much, Ian. I'm delighted to introduce the two Meritorious Award winners in 2020. The first winner is Professor Paul Emery from the UK. He served the rheumatology in an outstanding way. He was from 2004 to 2006 Eula Treasurer. And in the period 2007-2012, he was president, first president-elect, then active president, and then past president. The second Meritorious Award winner 2020 is Professor Stephen Gay from Switzerland. He served rheumatology in an outstanding way too. He was in the period 2007-2010 the chair of the investigative committee of EULAR and from 2012 to 2020, this is the liaison for Foreum. Well, thank you so much, Anna Maria, two thoroughly deserving recipients. Uh, we've asked them to share a few thoughts with us. What does rheumatology mean to me? And here's what they said. Thank you, EULAR, for this prestigious award. In 43 years in rheumatology, I have been privileged to be part of a revolution in management. Wheelchairs are now a rarity. I've also had the pleasure of training many talented rheumatologists who will ensure the revolution continues. As president, I was enabled to start two initiatives, Forum with Stefan and Emunet, both of which are now flourishing. Thank you, Eula, for these opportunities and thank you for the award. What rheumatology means to me 
is to explore the pathogenesis of rheumatic diseases. Even we could observe the tremendous progress from the SPAR-type therapies to the very powerful biologicals and small molecules, we still cannot cure rheumatic diseases. From the excellent mentorship of the late Gottfried Geiler, a leading experimental pathologist in Leipzig, Germany, as medical student, to the very educational time at the Max Planck Institute for Biochemistry in Munich, and the 20 years at UAB in Birmingham, Alabama, superbly guided by J. Claude Bennett, and eventually in Zurich, Switzerland, giving us a chance to develop a rheumatology research center for training of many wonderful international fellows, and most recently participating with Euler in the development of a European rheumatology research center, he may envision even better therapies. Thank you. I'd like to turn now to introduce you to the Forum, which is a foundation dedicated to the support of excellent rheumatology research across Europe. This foundation was formed a number of years ago and since its inception has supported outstanding and creative work performed by units right across Europe, always in collaboration and always focused on the needs of people with rheumatic and musculoskeletal diseases. Our donors are varied, and at this moment, we want to particularly recognize those who have been most generous in their support, our platinum donors in 2020. And to this end, my words of thanks are especially directed to Pfizer, to Eli Lilly, to UCB, to Abvi, to Galapagos, and to Novartis. Your generosity is great, We've done our best to put that generosity to good purpose in the pursuit of new understanding of the rheumatic musculoskeletal diseases. Our grateful thanks to you. Now, in addition to our meritorious awards, we also like to recognize as a mark of distinction the status of honorary member that we confer upon people who've rendered outstanding service in accomplishing the objectives of EULAR. And over the years, EULAR has bestowed honorary membership on many remarkable personalities. This year is no exception. So what I'm gonna do is announce the names of those recipients. And after each name, you're going to see a short video of what it means to be part of the EULAR family. So the first recipient in 2020 is Professor Leonard Calabrese in the United States. Thank EULAR and Professor McInnes for this honorary award be part of the EULAR family. When I think of EULAR, I think of a great meeting with great science and great cities, but really I think of all the professional and personal relationships that have grown out of my association. Again, thank you, and I look forward to coming back live next time. The next recipient is Professor Kazuhiko Yamamoto from Japan. I'm very much honored by this EULAR award. I've been working in the field of clinical and basic our rheumatology for these 40 years. During my presence of JCR, that is Japan College of Rheumatology and also of APRA, I have been involved in establishing EULA JCR as well as EULA APRA Young Rheumatologist Training Program. We would like to express our gratitude to the old members of EULA for this collaboration. Thank you very much. Our next recipient is Professor Ulf Müller-Ladner in Germany. Dear colleagues, Welcome to the virtual EULA Congress. Being a part of this and being a part of the EULA family means you share experience, you share challenges, you're amongst friends to solve problems like this and to be able to learn a lot for your personal life and for your patients. So enjoy and welcome to this kind of Congress. And next, Professor Laura Gossek in France. Dear colleagues, it's been a great honor for me to be part of the EULAR Executive Committee for the past four years. But it's also been a great pleasure and a lot of fun. Participating in the EULAR Executive Committee has allowed me to participate in collaborative projects. It has also allowed me to develop friendships. 
Yay for you, Lar. We're recognizing also Professor Xavier Mariette, also from France. I am very proud to receive this Yula Honorary Award. It means that now I am part of the Yula family for life. I've been working in Yula for 15 years. Firstly, I have learned. Then I have worked a lot. And now I will try to forward what I have learned to younger rheumatologists. Thank you again and enjoy the Congress. Bye. And finally, Ms. Nella Kayers from Belgium. I really believe that people with RMDs do have the expertise to make a difference in rheumatology. And within the Eulard family, and specifically the Pare family, of course, I, had, I found a way to use my expertise in living with an RMD to really make a difference and to improve the quality of care. I found ways to explore, to share, to brainstorm, to develop and really create something to change the world for everyone involved in rheumatology. The Eulard and the Pare family really offered me a place where I could make a difference and I knew that it really mattered. And for that, I'm forever grateful. Thank you. To all of you, I can say only my most sincere words of thanks. ULAR is a voluntary organization and you've given so much of your time, your expertise, the sacrifices away from family to make ULAR the extraordinary family that it is. Thank you so much. We come now to one of my favorite awards in the ULAR opening ceremony, the STEAM Prize. The STEAM Prize, for those of you who are not aware, is awarded for essays written by people with rheumatic musculoskeletal diseases. And over the years, we've generated an extraordinary legacy of insight. I commend these essays to you. I've had the privilege of reading many of them over the years, and I've always learned. This year's recipient of the prize has produced a work of extraordinary quality on the subject of what it means to volunteer. And so it's a real pleasure to announce this year's STEAM Prize winner, Christina Bankova. Uh, we're going to hear a little bit of her thoughts now. Volunteering for me, I can express through Greek philosopher Aristotle quote who said that the essence of life is to serve others and do good. In my essay is my story, how I have chosen to do my part to make this world a better place for people with RMDs. I'm confident there are countless ways to leave your input on the world. Voluntary work may come in all shapes and sizes, and every choice you make to serve the community matters. Well, that concludes this section of our opening ceremony, where we've recognized and rewarded people who've made extraordinary contributions and people who have given us great innovation for our Congress in 2020. I send my heartiest congratulations to them all. So over the last number of years, ULAR has extended its capabilities and scope, and I think that's been most uh, demonstrated in mm -hmm. the success of the ULAR school. We now have an extraordinary portfolio of educational opportunities online, face-to-face -face courses, knowledge, but also practical skills, for example, in the use of ultrasound and the treatment of people with RMDs. That's been a great success story. What are we gonna do next? Well, of course, building on that, we'd like to move to the other really important area for the future, which is research. And we're hoping as part of our 2023 strategy to create a new entity, namely the Virtual Research Center for Rheumatology. Our idea, basically put, is to bring the power of European rheumatology research together to really focus on what is possible to achieve innovation, creativity, and application of the most amazing technologies to really focus down on why people with RMDs have disease, to think about why the diseases occur, to think about how they could be prevented, and if not prevented, at least have their impact and quality of life mitigated to the maximum degree. So we brought a task force together over the last number of months. We've been thinking really carefully, and we wanted to tell you just a little bit about what we have in mind. 
But I'm going to turn to, to Dieter, first of all, as our uh, head of PARI. Dieter, what do you think the role of research in building a strong future for RMD patients is in Europe? I mean, why do we need research? Well, I think, um, and I'm thinking of my own career, I think, uh, I got ill uh, about 50 years ago. And, uh, well, the therapy in those days, that were glucocorticoids. So um, I think a lot has happened, especially in the last 20 years, and a lot of improvement for patients. But it does not work for all. And uh, we see that um, IMD still have a great impact on the individual's health, on, let's say, the health economy and the economy as a whole. And so we certainly need research so that we improve the situation for the individuals, but also then for the economy as a whole. And I think this is rather, rather important for all of us. Well, thank you so much, Dieter. A very personal view. And I have to say, really very moving to understand the impact of the individual, at the, the family, and of course, at the societal level. Clearly, research is absolutely crucial for the future. Uh, now, thinking of the future, of course, let us turn to the, the voice of the Young Rheumatology Network, Immunet, which is one of the most vibrant and exciting parts of the Eular family. Um, Alessandra, thanks for joining us. And um, maybe you can tell me a little bit about how a, a virtual research centre can work to integrate the power of rheumatology research across Europe. Thank you, Ian. I think that the key word is actually collaboration. And that's one of the core aims of Immunet to promote research and collaborations among young people uh, working in the field of rheumatology. Actually, we are very keen in developing initiatives about that, and we have been working in a database that is very extensive about the research activities of the ULAR Centers of Excellence. And I think that the VRC can actually build on that and promote even more mobility, knowledge exchange, learning, training among the young people, and, and in the future, develop even more um, broad in reach, reaching uh, research uh, collaboration. So from the internet side, we are very much looking forward to working with, with the DRC to promote research across Europe. Well, thanks so much for those remarks. That, that's an exciting prospect. Thank you also for conforming to the stereotype of the young person never being separated from their mobile phone. <laughs> um, Desiree, you, you've been listening to this discussion. What are your views? Well, the EULA's overarching objective for the VRC is to advance the high quality interdisciplinary research to finally improve the lives of people with RMDs. And this objective will be achieved through several aims. Let me mention a few. An important aspect is building RMD research capacity and facilitate collaborative research. This can be done by providing research infrastructure, services, expert consultations, training, and team science. And that includes basic scientists, clinical scientists, clinicians, patient organization. The team science is really important to tackle problems that cannot be overcome by one single team and also the engagement of the relevant stakeholders in every phase of the research process is really key. Um, now, of course, one of the other really important pillars in ULAR is the health professionals. Um, Thea, I'm, I'm sure you've got some opinions you'd like to share with us on this subject. Yes, thank you, Ian. Uh, yes, I think uh, the Virtual Research Center fits in very well with a, a holistic approach, and I'm sure that uh, by a better collaboration across Europe, the sum will be more than uh, um, uh, just its parts. And um, I think especially the fact that uh, uh, Euler is unique with already three pillars present, rheumatologists, uh, patients and health professionals, that is, will contribute very much to the success of the virtual research uh, center. And uh, from the perspective of uh, health professionals, I think uh, it must be stressed that there are many excellent scientists uh, among uh, health professionals that can uh, contribute greatly to the virtual research center. I'm really sympathetic to that last remark. I think it's important to say that the research center will be agnostic to discipline. 
Its purpose is to bring the brightest minds together across Europe, bringing those different interdisciplinary skills together to really focus on the major problems that face our patients. So thank you for those remarks to, to yeah. all of you. Um, Dieter, I, I want to come back to you now because we've said several times in our opening ceremony and throughout our philosophy of the organization that the patient is at the center. So how should patients be involved in this research process? Yeah, in, I think uh, in those last 10 years I've been involved there as well. It has been possible to um, really develop a fantastic patient research partner network. And what I could guess or what I think uh, is that it would be possible to give some guidance then also for researchers how to involve the so-called PRPs in research. Another item definitely would be also that we have got lots of international collaborations projects uh, where I could guess that uh, PRPs could be involved. And um, the PRP network of EULA is a model, I think, for the national societies to develop such a network on the national level as well. And I think it would be good then if we provide training opportunities for these national facilitators. So there are different opportunities, I think, and I hope uh, we will be able to develop and contribute as well. Oh, thank you, Dieter. I, I, I'm grateful to you for the offer, and I'm going to take that as a formal offer, and you'll be getting a letter in the post very shortly. Don't you worry. <laughs> we'll be busy, sir, and your colleagues. Well, of course, now the obvious question in your minds is, well, what are we actually going to do in this EULAR Virtual Research Centre platform? Well, I, I can think of no one better to turn to with that kind of really pragmatic question. What are we going to do next? Desiree. Well, there's really a wide range of activities that the EULA VSC likes to undertake. However, it will take really a few years to build this support. One of the activities that we will be the first one to start is the clinical trial design support. This will contain a self-service library of standard operating procedures, in short SOPs, and that will be built. And this provides an online resource for researchers to access those SOPs for clinical trials. And those SOPs will be updated regularly. And they are related to various regulatory foundations in different European countries. So they will include SOPs for the basic structure and design of clinical trials and case report forms. But you can also think of collaboration rules and code of conduct, for example, for the organization or administration, the meeting structure, communication, ownership. So there are really many different uh, topics. But also about data transfer agreements across borders. Uh, what, what is very important, the data protection and privacy uh, issues. And this from all the different aspects within Europe. And then a second pillar of the clinical trial design support will be to offer the expert consultations to assist researchers with the design of clinical trial protocols. And this can be in a wide range of areas, such as biostatistics and bioinformatics, trial design, or, or the regulatory knowledge support about epidemiology, data management, you name it. And then the third pillar of the clinical trial design support will be providing training opportunities on clinical trials, especially for early career uh, scientists, but also for established researchers and for health professionals. And this all will be done, of course, in collaboration with the EULA School. But this is just one example of the many activities that will start. But there will also be activities more focused on translational research and big data, which are other examples. So we are really will start with some of the activities, but build them during the next few years. Oh, well, thanks so much, Tiziri. That's a, a pretty ambitious set of activities that you have planned for the next number of months and years. And I, I can already imagine the kinds of data and the kinds of impact that we can generate as a result of that. 
Um, Taya, you, you've also been listening to that. Where do you think the practical benefits are going to be in health professional research? Yes, uh, indeed, uh, health professionals are uh, practical uh, people, and so they would very much favor uh, the ambitions of the VRC to develop uh, education and practical tools for the conduct of uh, research. But uh, furthermore, I think that health professionals have an enormous uh, expertise in specific fields of research, like uh, complex interventions and their uh, evaluation, uh, qualitative research, and for example, implementation research. And I think that will um, very much uh, help the virtual research center. Well, thanks so much, Tia. Insightful again, as ever. Um, Alessandra, you're, you're listening to this. What are your views? Well, I think that there are, for sure, a lot of young people that are very keen taking part of the VRC uh, and learning and making research collaborations. And even that has a very long history in promoting the integration of young people working in the field of rheumatology with ULA. So I can really see that we can also work here in making this connection between the young people and the VRC uh, in the learning and in the research among young people working in the field of rheumatology. So I'm actually looking very much forward to it. So we're going to have integration of Emunet in every practical platform that the, the research center delivers. And thank you for that undertaking. And you will enrich that platform very much as a result. Um, we're coming towards the end of this discussion. Dieter, I, I want to give the last word to you. What would success look like in 10 years' time for our research centre? I think one success would definitely be if we know more about preventive measures, especially if I look at inflammatory rheumatic diseases. That is, what is preventive possible so that we do not get the disease? The second point, I think, is if we get the disease, that there is a drug so that we take that drug for a certain amount of time uh, and then definitely we've got remission and we do not need that drug anymore and not that we have to continue with that drug uh, for years. So these would be, this would be my dream world and I think a lot will be possible. Um, I've been involved in EULA now for 10 years, I think, uh, with an increasing intensity and uh, I think um, I see that patients, health professionals and clinicians and scientists work together. I'm quite optimistic that a lot can be achieved. Dieter, Eular has benefited massively from your input in those last 10 years, not least because you continue to give us the biggest challenges by setting the most important questions. I think you've asked us to deliver uh, prevention, remission, and eventually cure for the rheumatic and musculoskeletal diseases. Thank you for setting our ambitions so high, and thank you for giving our new research centre such an important mission. Of course, it's a work in progress, and we need to manage expectation. This will take us a number of years to establish the frameworks and platforms for success. But I think in these days when technology is moving so quickly, that the opportunity to really bring together the very brightest minds to focus on research into rheumatic musculoskeletal diseases is surely the highest ambition that we can aspire to. So to all of you, thank you so much for joining this discussion. It's been really very inspiring for me. It's great to listen to you setting the standards and setting out your own ambitions. I thank you all. While we're coming to the end of our opening ceremony, uh, the rheumatic musculoskeletal diseases remain one of the biggest challenges to the well-being of mankind. And it's such a joy for us to bring you all together, bringing the brightest minds to focus on the most important questions. We are, of course, disappointed that we've done this in a virtual rather than a personal way. But our hospitality is extended in the philosophical sense, even if not in the practical sense this time round. I hope that you'll enjoy the Congress. I hope that you will dive deeply and drink well of its content, not only over the next few days, but in the coming weeks, because access will be maintained for you. I want to say just a few words of thanks. First of all, to the extraordinary executive committee. The work of EULAR is done on a voluntary basis. The work is extensive. The, the work is done well, and it makes an extraordinary difference 
for people with rheumatic musculoskeletal diseases. I want to send my thanks out to the pillars of ULAR, to the national societies who are essentially ULAR itself, to the, to the medical professionals, to the health professionals, and of course to PARI at the centre of it all. And this year, a special word of thanks to the ULAR Secretariat. ULAR is an organisation that is growing and changing in ways that you couldn't even imagine. And to add to that, the need to create a, a virtual electronic congress has been, as you can probably think, quite a challenge. And yet our amazing secretariat with the Congress management team have risen to that challenge. I hope that you will enjoy the product of their labors. And I hope that you will, at the end of the Congress, join me in thanking them once again. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I wish you a most successful Congress. I wish you every good fortune. And especially in these challenging times, I wish you the very best of health. Thank you so much.